start letting people in. Um, are you okay if we record this? Mm -hmm. John, is it good with you? Okay. Kate, who's going to go first? Um, how about we'll have Jean go first and you? That's fine. Sound good. And I can share my screen, I'm assuming. Yes. Um, yeah, do you see the green button? You have permission to do that? Yeah, yeah great. Uh -huh. Yeah, you're listed as a host here. Um, and lecture series. I'm really excited today to have our guests. Um, we have from um, coming from us in NC State, North Carolina. Tell me, Jean. North Carolina State University. I North just didn't want to get it wrong. Um, North Carolina State University. Jean Resitano is a William Neal Reynolds Distinguished Professor. Um, and she works on population genetics of historical potato famine epidemics and studies of the population structure of pre present day late blight outbreaks. Restano's lab was the first to develop pioneering research techniques to, to um, recover DNA from 150 year old historic herbarium species. And she just published this year, co-edited um, a book, Emerging Plant Diseases and Food Security uh, came just in time for our pandemic. Uh, John McNeil is University Professor of History at Georgetown University. He's the author of many books and many, many, many articles. Um, but the one you're working on now that's pertinent, well, there's one that you've published a number of years ago, Mosquito Empires, Ecology and War in the Greater Caribbean, 1640 to 1914, and that's a 2010 book. But the one you're gonna publish next year, John, co-edited book is, is now called, um, but it's not a final title, Sea and Land and Environmental History of the Caribbean. And that will be out with Oxford University Press in 2021. Is that right? Um, and Tristan Brown of MIT History Department is also joining us. And Tristan is an assistant professor in the history section here. And he focuses on Chinese environmental history, religion, and law. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, Jean's gonna um, uh, give a short presentation and then John will, and then we'll open it up to, for a discussion. Go ahead, Jean. I'm unmuted now. And let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to talk to you about emerging plant diseases that threaten food security and your breakfast. Many of you are aware of the uh, COVID-19 outbreak that we're in the middle of right now with a pandemic, a global pandemic affecting people and their livelihoods and their health. But we also have plant pathogens that cause outbreaks and plant pathogens impact food production. We have dwindling natural resources globally. We have to protect our food supply while protecting ecosystem services and redu reducing the downstream impacts of, of, of agriculture on the environment. And in order to, with a growing population globally, in order to meet, meet the projected demand, we need uh, increased food production by about 60% by 2050. The FAO published last uh, two years ago, these challenging, uh, a list of challenges that are shaping the future of food. And among those are outbreaks of trans transboundary pests and pathogens. I've circled that here. This includes plant diseases, emerging plant diseases on agricultural food crops and forest ecosystems, also animal diseases. And with the, in the midst of this COVID outbreak, we know that COVID-19 jumped from uh, animal 
sources into humans. So pathogens can move across species boundaries from plants to animals to humans. I focus my work on plant pathogens that cause plant disease and they're on the increase. This, this was published a few years ago, but we see in North America, the reports of outbreaks globally on different continents are on the increase. And there's a potential for more emerging pests and pathogens because of trade. We have a lot of uh, movement of crops and commodities uh, from one country to another. And as people say, plant pathogens don't carry passports and they don't know borders and they move. People move plant material or pathogens can move in the, uh, in, uh, the air. We have uh, increasing emergence of plant diseases and they've increased in incidence and geography. We've had some strains of pathogens that have increased in pathogenesis or they're newly evolved or have been newly discovered. And I just wanna give you a few examples of when, I, when we talk about your breakfast and fat pathogens that might impact your breakfast. Uh, in, in Africa, a new race of, of stem rust pathogen, UG99, that infects wheat, uh, first emerged in East Africa and Uganda in 1999, and then it spread into the Middle East. And then the concern is that it would threaten India and the entire green revolution and wheat production there. So plant breeders have been busy trying to, uh, to uh, develop resistant varieties that'll stop that outbreak. Uh, another important pathogen that's causing disease currently, coffee rust, uh, it affects coffee in Central America and globally. It was actually first described in East Africa and then it's spread by colonization. The British colonization, they moved coffee from the Ethiopian center of origin into the Middle East and then into to India and to the Pacific uh, area. And this pathogen moved and hitchhiked with the coffee plants. In 2011, 2012, there was a huge outbreak in Central America, it defoliated the, the, the plantations and we had outbreaks at higher elevations due to climate change. Disease was not recognized in these areas previously and growers didn't know how to deal with it. So what happened was we had a huge migration of people as a result of the coffee rust outbreaks. 400 a uh, thousand migrant workers lost their livelihoods and many of them immigrated into the US uh, because of this. Um, coffee rust has just recently been found in Hawaii. I was on a phone call just last week. It had never spread into the Hawaiian islands and now it's in the Kona region and in Hilo. So they're scrambling to try and figure out how to save that crop because it will defoliate the plants and then you lose the, the plantation. Another serious pathogen on bananas, another breakfast food, uh, Panama disease, tropical race four, also found in Southeast Asia. It's migrated into parts of Southeast Asia and into Africa. And then just last year was found in Colombia in the Dole plantations. And we, most of our bananas that are imported into the US and Europe come from Central America. This new tropical race four will kill the Cavendish banana a problem with some of the uh, of these large scale productions of food crops is we have monoculture. Bananas in Central America are all one type, one variety, highly susceptible to this new race. There's there's uh, no resistance, so uh, the the food is the crop is vulnerable. And then I work on the pathogen that causes the Irish famine in 1840. This is a painting showing an Irish family uncovering their main food crop the potatoes and those potatoes were rotted by late blight. The pathogen moved in from South America into Europe, first the US, then to Europe. And the, the dependence of, of potatoes for the Irish food product, uh, supply was, uh, there was monoculture of the crop and then also not much diversity in the food. And so people, two million people died and another million immigrated. And I know I'm talking to a group of students at MIT, but if you, walk up to Harvard Square across the street from campus, you'll see a monument to the Irish famine. Never again should a people starve in a world of plenty. What happened, this disease came into the ports of New York and Philadelphia, moved in on potato tubers from South America and within two year period spread through the Northeast. And then in 1845, it hopped across the ocean in potatoes, might most likely exported from the US and caused disease. So we had, uh, the Irish famine occurring in Europe, and then we had the movement once again of people on coffin ships immigrating back into the U.S. I'm Italian and Irish, and about 40 million Americans can claim Irish ancestry due to this one plant pathogen. So when you think about crime scene, who's the victims? The victims were the Irish uh, smallholder farmers that were um, impoverished 
And in Philadelphia, there's a monument uh, at the ports of Philadelphia, the same port where the pathogen moved in, the Irish immigrants came in, in two years later. So we have uh, pathogens causing national security outbreaks, uh, national security insecurity and food security insecurity in countries. Now in 1845, we didn't know that pathogens cause disease. The germ theory hadn't been done by Louis Pasteur. So we had some pioneering early plant pathologists that really studied this disease and, under, and, and laid the groundwork for showing that germs and microbes could cause disease. And the pathogen is Phytophthora festans. It's not just a thing of the past. Actually, this is a smallholder in Guatemala who has to deal with this disease every year. Our growers in the US have to spray fungicides multiple applications, 15 to 20 applications to control late blight every year. And in Europe, the same. In Central America and South America, where there's more rainfall, highly sprayed crop. In fact, potato is sprayed more than any other food crop because of this pathogen. We don't have stable resistance. And we have monoculture of susceptible varieties. So in 2009, we had a big outbreak in the US and our team and several others started working on it. It was like a tomato disaster, but we did not have monoculture. We weren't only eating tomatoes in 2009. We have diverse food source. So the, out but the outbreak was severe enough and it was caused by distribution of plants, tomato transplants in home gardens that spread then into fields. So our team got together. We started, we actually did some Google searching. We saw this peak of searches for blight on your summer 20, 2009, but everybody searches, does, does Google searches in the summers for their diseases on their tomatoes, but it peaked in 2009. And this was due to tomato late blight. So the pathogen causes disease on tomato and potato. And now my lab kind of runs a big disease surveillance system. This is kind of reminiscent of what you might see if you look at the John Hopkins site for COVID-19. But this is a map of outbreaks of late blight in the US, the frequency of occurrence, the top states with disease. We're doing genetic analysis to genotype strains. And we're also developing tools to help growers mitigate disease. For, for late blight, we use fungicides to spray. Also another kind of connection to MIT in 2009, a big group of us had money from the Broad Institute. And we sequenced the genome of Phytophthora infestans. This is a picture on the cover of Nature. We sequenced the genome, compared it to other Phytophthoras. And we figured out that the genome is very large and expanding and the breeding and actual breeding work is leading to expansion of the pathogen. I've, um, as Kate mentioned, I've done work on historic outbreaks. We've used historic herbariums collections. Some of those present up at Harvard. This is Don Feaster and the Farlow um, Herbarium up at Harvard. We've sampled their collections and we actually sequenced the whole genome from the historic outbreaks. And using that genome sequence, we can track how things spread. We can compare historic to modern day genotypes. And we're using that information to better manage modern day disease. And I just kind of want to end with this uh, map showing global colonization of the famine strain from South America into ports of New York and Philadelphia, across into Ireland. And then what we've now recently found by sequencing lots of samples globally is that this pathogen moved with globalization, uh, British colonization into Australia, into in India, into East Africa, former British colonies were the site of movement of this pathogen. So there's a kind of a deep connection between history, colonization by peoples, movement of plants and diseases. And with that, I will just kind of end so John can talk and then we'll take some questions. Great. <laughs> so uh, John will start talking in just a moment, but um, is it permissible if I ask uh, Gene, a quick question before I start. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, Gene, is is it possible to know whether what you what you call the famine lineage of uh, late blight was a problem in South America before it exploded into the world in the early nineteenth century? Yeah, and actually, um, a lot of my research on the population genetics end of things has been to compare modern day populations from South America to Europe and the US and do the ancestry, the, the phylogeny to figure out if the ancestors of Phytophthora infestans were found in South America. And they were. We actually have a, a, a published a paper two years ago to show that the ancestral history is deeply linked to Peru and Colombia. 
And the other thing, there's historical literature, and I've delved into that a bit, the migration routes of transport, you know, the Colombian trade movement. Potatoes moved several hundred years before the disease moved. But in 1845, this is when the steamships were developed, there was faster movement of potatoes, because this is a cool weather pathogen. If it sits in the hull of a ship at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it's going to die. But in a fast moving steamship in, uh, you know, moving in six, seven days, it can move into, uh, into other areas of the world. And I think kind of the technology to develop quicker movement of commodities on the oceans uh, helped move this pathogen. There's also old literature in, uh, by the Spaniards. I've, I've been collecting some of that, trying to decipher it. But in 1845, there were quotes from Colombia saying the native Indians knew how to deal with this disease. They simply rogued out the diseased potatoes and then planted amongst their diversity of tubers. And if you've been to the Andean region, you know they grow not one monoculture, they grow hundreds of varieties of potatoes. And that buffered them from a severe outbreak. But when the one type of tuber with the pathogen entered into Europe and the US, we had monoculture and an outbreak. So it's almost like analogous to uh, right now, we have no vaccine for COVID-19, we're all susceptible. But if you, have some, if you have some buffering with vaccines and herd immunity, you don't get disease. For late blight, if we had potato varieties that were different varieties with levels of resistance, we wouldn't have an outbreak. In the Andes, they didn't have severe disease, but in Europe and the US, we did. Okay, that makes perfect sense, thank you. So. Um, now John will start talking. I don't have any slides, for, so I apologize for that. But I do have a little bit that connects uh, loosely with what Jean was talking about. Colonization, uh, transfer of plants, commodities, pathogens, um, with some consequences. So as Kate said at the outset, uh, some years ago I wrote a book called Mosquito Empires, mainly about yellow fever and uh, malaria mainly in the Caribbean region. And I've not entirely put that down. I'm uh, working in the general region of uh, Caribbean health and disease history uh, again. The work that uh, I did is mainly in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. And the short version, so you don't have to go read my book, uh, is that Ecological changes in the 17th century made the Caribbean much, much, much more hospitable to certain kinds of mosquitoes that serve as vectors for yellow fever and malaria. Basically, ecological changes associated with plantation production, production mainly of uh, sugar. And yellow fever and malaria, once they became endemic, is always present uh, in the Caribbean, exercised a political impact. They were partisan in the geopolitical inter-imperial struggles among Spain, France, and Britain. And the reason for that is that, in short, the Spanish defended their territories in the Caribbean with people who were either born and raised in the Caribbean and had survived yellow fever and malaria in childhood and were therefore immune to yellow fever and resistant to malaria. Yellow fever is an acute viral disease. If you live through it, you're good for life. Malaria, you build up resistance after repeated uh, bouts, very painfully, but immunity is beyond uh, reach for most humans. Um, so the British and French, on the other hand, fought their wars in the Caribbean with people recruited from Europe or um, in some instances from North America, people who are highly susceptible to yellow fever and malaria. So when armies clashed, thousands of people died, mainly not from combat, but from yellow fever and malaria. And in many instances, 50%, 80% of British and French armies were destroyed by disease. Then when people in this region started fighting wars of independence, which began in the 1770s, they enjoyed the partisan advantage of 
uh, greater immunity or resistance to yellow fever and malaria. And people sent out from Europe to prevent independence in Haiti, in Spanish America, uh, died from yellow fever and malaria in extraordinary numbers, helping the cause of revolution in the Caribbean. So this is an instance in which mosquito-borne disease made important by ecological change had powerful political implications. Now, how do we connect that to our pandemic? It seems to me that this kind of work, not just mine, other people's as well, um, poses the question, invites the question of the political, specifically geopolitical implications of COVID-19. In the example I just talked about, it was differential resistance and immunity leading to differential mortality, mainly in warfare, but also in colonization efforts that made these diseases politically important. Is differential mortality to COVID-19 gonna have political importance? My guess would be no. Will differential mortality due to different response matter politically? My answer would be yes, at least for a few years, because there's such spectacular difference between the bungled responses in some countries and the crisp responses in some other countries. That in terms of soft power and influence, there are um, redistributions of power underway. Will they last for long? I don't know. My guess is for a few years at least. Nextly, vaccine politics. Is that going to matter? Who gets the vaccine? Who gets it first? How well is it going to work? Who cashes in? I think this is going to matter a lot. I think vaccine nationalism is already underway. And it's going to play out in ways that I cannot foresee. But I think it's going to be uh, important uh, for several years, not least because SARS-CoV-2 is going to be with us for many years, probably forever. In fact, I think it's a safe bet it will be with us forever because it has animal reservoirs. It cannot be extinguished the way smallpox was extinguished, extinguished in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Um, because the animal reservoir makes that effectively impossible, as it does for uh, malaria and yellow fever for that matter. So we're probably looking at a world where some people can walk fearlessly amid SARS-CoV-2 while others can't, as was the case with the immunity to yellow fever centuries ago. And how will that fearlessness, so to speak, be distributed? It's unclear, but it might well carry uh, international political implications. And my last suggestion here, two last suggestions, can, um, this is a grim way to look at it, can SARS-CoV-2 be weaponized? By 1760, at the latest, yellow fever was effectively weaponized. The Spanish understood that in the Caribbean, that differential immunity existed. They didn't know why. They didn't know how yellow fever was communicated, but they observed, it wasn't hard to observe, that it killed some groups and didn't kill other groups. And they used that in their uh, defense strategy for the Caribbean. And similarly, when the Revolutionary Wars began in the Caribbean, in Haiti, Toussaint Louverture recognized differential uh, vulnerability and differential immunity to yellow fever, and he used that to his advantage in his revolutionary war, even without any sophisticated understanding of the etiology of the disease, how it's communicated, or how uh, immunity works. Can SARS-CoV-2 be weaponized? Um, so if you have a really good vaccine, for example, other people don't have it, and if you regard international politics as an arena of intense zero-sum competition, maybe you encourage the spread of COVID-19. 
because you have a good vaccine uh, and others don't. Um, I'm sure this has occurred to people who run bioweapons programs around the world. Not that I know any of these people personally, but some of them live about 30 or 40 miles away from me at Fort Meade in the state of Maryland. Well, they work there, they don't live there. Lastly, will the pandemic change balances of power via some intermediate variables? One example would be energy prices and energy markets. Energy prices have tanked since the pandemic began. It could be that peak oil demand has already passed. This is really bad for the producers of the more expensive kinds of oil in the world, including Russia, Venezuela, Canada. It's less bad for Saudi Arabia because their oil is cheaper to get out of the ground than anybody else's. And as long as there's some demand for oil, there's gonna be demand for Saudi oil. But the pandemic through an intermediate variable, whether it's energy prices or something else, may also have a considerable impact on the distribution of power in the international system. Just as I maintain yellow fever and malaria had in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. So that's my spiel. Thank you. Thank you both for, uh, for introducing your research and posing those fascinating questions. I guess to start off, I wanna pick up on something that John was referencing about this international cooperation and, and conflict potentially. And when I, was, when I was listening to both of your presentations, especially genes, it, it, it struck me that you know, with plant pathogens you know, in the 19th century, for instance, with potato late blight in Peru might not have a huge impact, then it goes into another environment, has a huge impact. And the need to trace and detect is so important and that requires you know, international cooperation. So Gene, I wanted to ask you, um, or just brought both of you broadly, you know, within plant pathology today, how much international cooperation around plant pathogen detection is there? I know you mentioned your lab doing a lot of work in the United States, but what's the landscape like? So for uh, Phytophthora infestans and late blight, uh, in Europe and the US, we are doing pretty extensive genotyping and we have disease surveillance networks. In Europe, it's called Euroblight. In the US, it's USA blight. And we're actually scaling that to Southeast Asia and Latin America. Uh, and there's an open data source and we're mapping outbreaks and genotyping. That's only true for late blight and stem rust of wheat. There are a myriad of other plant pathogens that we don't have global detection systems for, and, we're, and uh, countries tend to not share data uh, because it affects their trade and import and exports. If uh, uh, one country has a disease and they, they wanna say on wheat and they wanna export to the US and we don't have it here, announcing they have that disease is gonna affect whether they can ship into the US. So there are phytosanitary standards and detection systems globally, but the data sets aren't shared. And it's unfortunate because if we did share data at a landscape level globally, we could prevent movement of pathogens from one country to another. Our detection systems that we're using are kind of similar. We, we've developed, I didn't talk about it in this talk, but we've developed sensor technology that can be used with smartphones to do quick assays. And some of this technology is actually being tested now for COVID with uh, one of my engineering colleagues. So the, the ability to test and trace plant diseases is as important as human diseases to prevent movement. Because once the, the horse is out of the barn, you know, once it's out and it's spread, then you're in a mitigation strategy where you're trying to deploy a vaccine or a fungicide to control a disease. And, uh, you know, the idea is to prevent movement. And it, it requires uh, policy changes at government levels for that to happen. We just submitted a white paper on this to PNAS and there have been there was a paper in science last year on this. And uh, there's a move, uh, USAID is just is announcing a, a, a innovation lab to fund emerging plant disease threats because we need to coordinate at the global level. I guess a related question I wanted to ask John is, when we look at uh, pathogens in history, how do you find as a historian tracing these, right? I know you address this in Mosquito Empires, but I, you know, I'd love to hear you talk about it. 
you know, at a time when people don't necessarily, you know, they didn't even have germ theory, you know, pre-1897, you know, what are the, what are some of the historical sources and records we can use to, you know, trace these diseases over time? Okay, I, I'm, I may have to shout because uh, one of my neighbors seems to have uh, acquired a new supercharged leaf blower and is <laughs> experimenting okay. with it. Um, apologies for that. So um, I'll answer your question in just a moment, Tristan, but I want to say something about the question that you posed to Gene when it comes to uh, not plant pathogens, but um, the pandemic. Um, and I just a moment ago spoke about vaccine nationalism, but on the other side of the scale, um, remember that early in uh, 2020, I think it was still in January, the genome of SARS-CoV-2 was published on the web by Chinese uh, geneticists, mm. jump-starting uh, research uh, all around the world, giving us a bit of a head start uh, in uh, vaccine development, for example. So uh, there are examples of lack of cooperation in the face of mobile pathogens, whether it's plant pathogens or human pathogens, but there's also instances of enhanced uh, cooperation that have had uh, favorable results. I mean, the, the vaccine development, the speed of it around the world is just amazing compared to any historical episode of vaccine development. Uh, and that's great. Now, tracing diseases uh, in times past before anybody understood uh, about the microbiological dimensions uh, of disease and interpreted disease in, in quite different ways. So uh, I sometimes refer to this as um, the dark matter of history. So you know that the astrophysicists tell us that most of the matter in the universe we can't see, it's invisible, but we know it's there because of uh, observable uh, impacts in things we can see. So rotational speed of galaxies, for instance, is influenced by the gravitational pull of stuff we can't see, but we know it has to be there because of the way the galaxies behave. So history is a lot like that too. There's stuff we can't see. The mosquitoes left no memoirs. The viruses, bacteria left no memoirs. And nobody wrote about them because they didn't understand that they existed. But we can see that they were there uh, indirectly uh, in documents. Uh, and this is most of what uh, I have done in my work. But now it's also possible for people with the right kind of education and labs to trace uh, disease history and its historical geography, its spread uh, through uh, paleogenomics, uh, looking at uh, human tissues, um, but not exclusively uh, human tissues. And this is very complicated work. It's very expensive work. It has some elements of uh, controversy and its uh, techniques are changing and improving very rapidly. So in 10 years, uh, paleopathology based on paleogenomics is gonna be 10 times better than it is now. But there are a lot of labs uh, in mainly Europe and the US that are doing this work. And they've had uh, really interesting results um, sorting out particularly plague history, but to some extent, smallpox and even yellow fever. And even uh, TB, I know there was an early report years back of you know, using uh, Andean mummies to find the TB organism in the lungs of a mummified person. Uh, you know, the idea was that this was not in the old world and that it had been moved in from Europe. So uh, yeah, and using museum collections. Yeah, in fact, that's a great example, Jean, because um, the TB that was found in Andean mummies is hypothesized to have uh, transferred from uh, seals, South American seal populations. So it's another uh, pathogen that jumped species and a lot of the TB in the world today looks like it comes from this particular source. 
not as had been assumed only 10 years ago from uh, old world, uh, I believe it was cattle populations. That's a revolutionary change in our understanding of the history of tuberculosis. Interesting. That's fascinating. I, I have a question about, a really ghoulish question about just fatalities. Um, what's the greater cause of um, human fatalities, human diseases that may come from zoonotic sources like you're talking about, like TB, John, and COVID, or plant pathogens that then cause famines? And, and that might seem like, well, obviously, you know, human diseases cause more humans to die. But if you think of the big famines, especially, you know, just started the 19th century with the, the great, what, you know, Davies calls the great Victorian, Victorian Holocaust, where 20 million or more died in India. There was the big famines in uh, Russia and in China that have to do with and often the, the wheat um, rust and stuff like that. So which, what's the bigger, you know, the bigger killer of humans, plants or, plants or viruses and bacteria? So it's not that easy to disentangle because uh, malnourishment and disease um, uh, coincide and you, cannot really easily say somebody died because they were malnourished and then therefore more susceptible to disease or they died uh, only because of disease. Um, in some cases you can because there are uh, infections that are not really responsive to malnutrition, but a lot of them are responsive to malnutrition. So these things are uh, synergistic in a ghoulish way, but if I had to answer your question, um, even though it's impossible to answer for that reason, I would say uh, it is uh, infectious disease rather than famine that has caused more death uh, in the last 10,000 years of human experience. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I guess maybe I could throw one interesting point on that as well is, you know, tracing what, you know, the, measuring that is so difficult. And I'm thinking of the example, you know, Kate referenced um, uh, in, in passing uh, in China, right? You know, the, you know, the Great Leap Forward, this huge, you know, famine, 30 to 45, you know, 40 million people died in the course of three years. And of course, you know, there's this big debate in China going back to 1962, man-made disaster versus natural disaster. And uh, prior to 1981, the famine was, you know, those years were called the, the three years of natural disaster. And uh, after the famine, all of, the, all of these plant pathogens were identified by the state to say, oh, you know, there, you know, there was rice blast really bad in all these counties. Uh, wheat, you know, wheat, various types of wheat, wheat rust, you know, uh, wrecked havoc uh, among these provinces. And, you know, one, you know it's an interesting question of, to how, how much are those statistics can we can we can we take right I mean clearly those were there and, and caused you know had an impact but at the same time it's woven into these political discourses which makes you know identifying you know the root causes so difficult so the plant pathogens are just scapegoats for <laughs> yeah, human -caused they can famines. Be. as they you can see in Ireland right they were no. they were exporting wheat from the, the island of Ireland while people were starving in Ireland no. proper they become part of a political uh, drama, you know, whether, you know, the disease, they didn't, they didn't understand that pathogens cause disease. And then there was the accusations that the Irish were not farming well, they were lazy, that this was a curse from God, the atmosphere was bad, they didn't, uh, you know, there was a blaming of the Irish and there was sort of, you know, there was this like this racial connotations to this. But, you know, the idea, you know, when I look back, the Bengal famine in India caused by a pat plant pathogen killed 3 million people. The Irish famine killed 2, you know, you know, two, uh, two million people. I don't know what the statistics are on human disease outbreaks of these, the plague was huge, obviously. But when human health is impacted by human diseases, agriculture suffers too. You have smallholders that have malaria or AIDS, they can't farm or COVID, they're not farming as well. It's impacting country stockpiles of foods. So they're really interrelated uh, very closely. And it would be interesting to try and dissect some of those numbers out. I don't know that anybody's actually looked at it. We have uh, some questions from the, our, the people in the audience. Um, 
Megan Black asks, looking at these historic global scale pathogen threats, are there any lessons to be drawn about the changing role of surveillance in, so in society? Here I'm wondering about the implications of national and international surveillance infrastructure, such as contact tracing apps, as they infiltrate the private sphere bodies, et cetera. And you mentioned um, how you're using Google data to, to trace plant pathogens, Gene. Um, do you, either of you have any, any comment on that? Some of it's, uh, uh, you know, we're developing sensors and apps right now that could be uh, used to trace plant diseases uh, and give us a better handle on how things are spreading. But on the, I'm not, you know, on the human disease side, whether people want, uh, you know, the contract tracing is difficult and, and uh, you know, the IT and the, the personal, your personal liberties versus being uh, under surveillance, you know, this kind of this big brother kind of concern. I know in China right now, they're using apps to track, say, if one person has COVID, that, who, who the contacts might be so that they can lock, lock down people and keep them from spreading. And that's being taken very seriously. I was talking to a, a colleague of mine who was in Wuhan in December and has family there. And they have one source, one outbreak source in the, the house or the apartment building and they lock everybody down for a certain amount of time. So it can be used in a kind of, to stop outbreaks, but in a punitive sense and it affects people's liberties. Um, yeah, on, we, we haven't advanced that far in contract tracing of plant pathogens and spread, but, but you know, the idea that this concern about spreading across borders and sharing information is still, there's this uh, blockage there in terms of, 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 of uh, wanting to have open data sources. And uh, so it's, a, it's an important question. Yeah, I, I would say that um, this is going to be really interesting around the world because there's no doubt that the um, mechanisms and technologies of surveillance are going to be useful in uh, checking disease, but the cultural and political uh, attitudes towards uh, intrusiveness required to make these technologies and mechanisms maximally effective differs everywhere. And so uh, there's going to be a lot of tussle going on within societies and among societies about how to implement what can be implemented. I mean, just even wearing a mask has be so, become so controversial and who would have, who would think that? But, uh, you know, the idea of personal liberty and my freedom matters more than societies. You know, this is where people come, or some attitudes and it's, it's caused pandemics to spread, so. Um, we have some other questions. Um, what are some large structural changes to farming that could take place that would help mitigate plant pathogen issues? Can you paint this picture for us? Um, and when do different parts of the world start regulating agriculture to minimize the threats of incoming plant pathogens? So in terms of structural changes, they're already occurring. Uh, people are starting to think about managing uh, epidemics on a landscape level by uh, rather than planting susceptible varieties in a nation, uh, planting resistant varieties at the landscape level in areas where pathogens occur to, to prevent spread. So those kind of changes are happening in parts of Europe and the UK, say with some of the serial diseases and potato diseases. Uh, so you can project where to deploy resistance only deploy it where it's needed so it's not overcome by the pathogen. And then also another tool is to develop multi-lines or plant multiple resistance types in a field. So you're kind of creating a polyculture rather than a monoculture to shut down disease. So those sorts of things are starting to happen. And as we have more surveillance data on a global level, we can be more strategic, strategic about where we deploy resistance. And then in terms of regulating agriculture, it's highly regulated now. There are phytosanitary groups in each country and we have national plant or, uh, organizations that monitor pests and pathogens and uh, put up uh, regulatory barriers to prevent importing. Uh, 
problem is we, we move so many commodities around the world, it's often difficult to detect when something new occurs. And so we, have all, we always have new emerging threats. So it requires APHIS, USDA at our borders, in, inspecting container ships to do a better job of, and they're using new technologies to try and determine what's coming in. And knowing what the large trading partners are can impact where you sample both on the ground at the ports and also in the home country where things are being shipped. So uh, there's a lot of regulation occurring and uh, you know, it's helping to stop transmission of some diseases, plant diseases. Uh, John, I was um, wondering, you know, we, we talked a little bit about you know, travel and, and this question is generated at travel. Um, and there's been some, um, and I wonder, you know, we, we talk about sort of, you know, single species or monocrops and, but there's some speculation that on the slave ships, the, the mosquito from Africa, which doesn't like urban areas and doesn't feed on humans much, met the mosquito from Europe, which was urban and did like humans. And there created a new kind of, but didn't have malaria, didn't have the ability to carry malaria, that, that they met up there and they combined and became a new kind of super, super mosquito with a, with a, you know, like a cape on that, you know, could do both, could live in urban areas, liked humans and could pass along malaria. That it was actually this vector of the slave ships, a slow moving ship with lots of containers and lots of human bodies that created this sort of perfect storm of spreading disease. And I just was wondering if you, if you had heard that theory, this is something I, I read recently. Um, and whether this, this you know, sort of um, traveling itself creates not just spreads pathogens, but creates new pathogens along the way. Well, as to the latter proposition, um, travel creating new pathogens along the way, or new pathogens are always being created thanks to biological evolution. And uh, travel should uh, increase the pace of that because it creates new selection pressures. Uh, once an organism is transferred from one environment to another, different selection pressures come into play and evolutionary changes should result at a faster rate as a consequence. With regard to uh, super mosquitoes, I have not encountered this. I am highly skeptical of it. With respect to yellow fever mosquitoes, I'm quite sure it isn't true because I've followed the work uh, on uh, this is particular mosquito, Aedes aegypti, uh, genomics of it done at a lab uh, at Yale. Uh, and it is true that this particular mosquito came to the Americas um, in the 16th, or almost certainly in the 16th century, to judge by the paleogenomic work on the mosquito. And the extremely likely probability is that it did so in the hold of slave ships. But uh, the Aedes aegypti in West Africa and the Aedes aegypti in the Americas are 99.9999999% the same, which is a large part of the reason why um, we know that the mosquito is a, uh, in the Americas is a West African origin and not East African origin, which genetically is a slightly different uh, flavor of Aedes aegypti. I haven't followed the uh, mosquito genomics work on anophelines. Uh, these are malaria or a genus of mosquitoes that uh, many of which are competent vectors for malaria. Haven't followed that quite as uh, closely, but I would be uh, extremely skeptical of the proposition that Afri first of all, there are many, many different kinds of anophelines there's about 400 of them, uh, if I remember correctly. A lot of them in Africa, a couple, of, a few of them in Europe, and by and large, rather different ones in the Americas. And the ones that have been, uh, with one exception, efficient malaria vectors in the Americas are, as far as we can tell, indigenous to the Americas. The big exception is uh, Anopheles gambii, which is a West African mosquito, extremely good vector. Uh, and it is also established in the Americas, probably again, thanks to slave ships. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any more questions, Tristan, 
we as we finish up. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess one question I wanted to ask, you know, speaking of thinking about COVID in this year, and I know, you know, we talked about the geopolitics of it. I mean, this, this goes back, I think, to the Green Revolution, but there's this narrative of, especially you see this in China, progress, right? We've made all this progress, the first hybrid rice varietals in 1970s for commercial use, and we, we can defeat all these diseases. There's this real confidence, right? But at the same time, when I, when I listen to both of you, right, there's, there's this sense of, oh my goodness, there's so many viruses out there ready to jump. There's all these emerging and re-emerging uh, plant pathogens. So is, is our progress an illusion? I mean, I, maybe, to, you know, I know it's broad, but I wanted to just see what you think. It's too soon to tell. <laughs> uh, the progress is not an illusion, I believe. Um, well, from plants, the Green Revolution brought higher yields, resistance to diseases, moved countries out of poverty and people out of poverty, but we're not done. We're always working because as I mentioned, there are always newly emerging diseases and we do have hybrid pathogens that have hybridized between different species or jumped host from one host to another as the commodity was moved into a continent. And uh, so it's, you know, we have a lot of work to continue. I, I gave a talk at the Science Museum a few years ago about lake blight and this six-year-old child stood up and said, this disease has been around for 150 years, you know, why is it still a problem? And it was a very good question because there, uh, you know, even though we've thrown resistance genes out into agriculture, these pathogens figured out a way to overcome the resistance, just like bacteria can overcome, anti uh, become resistant to antibiotics. There's different mechanisms that pathogens use, plant pathogens. And so we're in an arms race. We're always continually trying to come up with a new and clever way to manage these diseases using either host resistance or biotechnology tools or surveillance. So our work is not yet done, but we've, we've accomplished a lot in 150 years. Uh, I certainly agree with that. It's also true that a great deal of that could be canceled uh, with some really bad luck. I mean, imagine a uh, pathogen with the transmissibility of SARS-CoV-2, that's a whole lot more deadly, just as deadly as uh, the original SARS uh, from 2003 or four, or as deadly as um, yellow fever before there was a yellow fever vaccine, or as deadly as smallpox, and yet as transmissible as what we're dealing with now. That would make a lot of our progress look illusory. Well, thank you, John McNeil, Jean Ristano, Tristan Brown. I, it's been a great session. I appreciate your joining us. And thank you, everybody in the audience, for participating in today's um, Plagues and Pandemics. Till next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Hey, hey Tristan, bye -bye. can I ask you yes, a question? Yeah. Um, yes. So, great leap forward. Um, Frank Dick Otter and whoever it was who wrote Tombstone. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, I can't remember his name. Wang, something or other. Are those the latest word or is there new literature out there? That uh, yeah, there's a, I mean, there's, there's all, I mean, on the Great Leap Forward literature, there's, there seems to be a never ending stream of, of, of books written about it. Um, I think Decoder's book is probably one of the most recent ones. I mean, it, it, there was the the COVID and there was the COVID and one. I think Tombstone was translated from Chinese, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I mean, there's a lot. I, you know, um, what is it? And then I think uh, Steve Harrell has a, has some new work on the Great Leap and um, on, so uh, yeah, on the Great Leap famine. Steve Harrell. I, yeah, I think that a lot of people touch on the famine, you know, um, but, um, you know, I'm trying to think about who, people who have a lot of work on the famine, to be honest with you, is all about debating the statistics about how many tens of millions of people died, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. So the, 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 the stuff that, you know, we want to get to, of you know, you know, the sort of the pathogens and, and those types of potential um, uh, additions. There's not a ton on it, to be honest. Aside from 
you know, Chinese, Chinese sources from the period that say those are the reasons. <laughs> so, you know, I was thinking as John was talking about uh, weaponizing COVID vaccines, you know, plant diseases, plant pathogens were weaponized in the past. And uh, prior, you know, during World War II, we had programs at Fort Detrick, the Germans had programs. What was deployed and what was actually used, it's not clear. But, um, you know, in terms of what you're talking about in China, that's interesting. And, uh, um, you know, there's been a history of over centuries. I mean, I've read stories of anthrax being laced into sugar cubes to feed the reindeer of the competing troops in Scandinavia to, to knock out the animals so that the, they couldn't move the troops. So, you know, there's this, um, this idea of... Um, is uh, interesting as well. Yeah. There's a East I mean, German, there was a persistent East German belief that uh, a, a potato beetle that was problematic from the point of view of potato production in East Germany was airdropped by mm -hmm. the US Air Force. The Colorado beetle. Colorado potato beetle, yes. Yeah. The name alone tells you something. Yeah. And you know, at that time, there were bombs being airdropped on the UK and people were dying. And this was, uh, potatoes were a main food source for the troops in, you know, the opposing enemies troops in Europe. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's now we have uh, bioweapons conventions and that's not done. And uh, we have enough trouble controlling diseases that occur by natural causes, by migrations of people and commodities. But um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting story. You know, one quick point, John, I was gonna mention that the, the, the other a book related to this question, you might know it is Sigurd Smalter's uh, Red Revolution, Green Revolution. And yeah. she looks at the, right, the scientific farming. And what's interesting, and this is actually, I think a, it's a bit connected to the Irish potato famine in a sense and the birth of plant pathology, because it's the, 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 you know, the horrors of the Great Leap give this rare opening in the Maoist era for scientists to kind of go a little bit unorthodox and, and actually you know, experiment with, um, you know, genetic hybrids and such, and that's what yielded some of the some of those breakthroughs in the 1970s. So, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting history. Who's that author? Sigrid Smaltzer. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Jean, do you worry about those fungicides that get poured onto fields? They're showing up in hospitals and and making people sick. Well, yeah. you know. Fungicides are a major source for control of plant diseases and used, used according to label, our food supply is safe. Uh, there are some crops that are sprayed more frequently. I didn't mention banana cigatoka, black cigatoka bananas. It's in the tropics, they have to spray 70 fungicide applications to control disease, but the fruit themselves are, it's not systemic, it's a protectant and the fruit are covered. Uh, we have re-entry uh, requirements before we harvest. So, um, and then people can make a choice to eat organic if they don't want to eat foods that have, but organic is not pesticide free. There are uh, uh, some chemicals that are applied on organic crops, but um, I mean, there are downstream impacts in some areas of the world, particularly where compounds are used incorrectly or, and now things are, uh, there's more precision application of fungicides. Uh, uh, rather than whole fields being sprayed, just problem areas and lower doses, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. It's not like the days when uh, DDT was just planes everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks you too. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, I did too. Thanks. It was nice meeting John and uh, Tristan, and I'll have to look for your mosquito book. It's good. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay, nice to uh, see you or meet you, as the case may be. I know. I get up to DC once in a while. I still have family there. I'd love to visit. And oh, good. Please do. When we, when we can travel again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, have a great right. weekend, everybody. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Great weekend. Yeah.